Greetings, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started in like five after seven, just as people are gathering. So hold tight. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hi, I'm Linda with the City of Milpitas and we're super excited to co-host with Alameda County Water District and have this great um, class by Loretta and I'll let Megan introduce herself. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Marino. I'm a water conservation specialist at the Alameda County Water District. Thanks Linda. Yeah, so we're just going to go over a couple logistics before we get the class going. Uh, Laura, can you go to the next slide? Perfect. Um, so as you might have noticed, all attendees are muted by default. And we will have time throughout the presentation where Loretta will pause for Q&A. Um, the way you can submit Q&A is by the Q&A um, at the bottom. So you can type it in. Also at the end of the session, you can raise your hand 
and um, we can unmute you to ask your question. But during the class, we request that you please type in your questions to the Q&A box, and we will make sure that these are addressed either throughout the class or we will have a longer Q&A at the end. And this webinar is being recorded and will be made available um, and we will definitely send the recorded link to everyone who has it, who's attending tonight. So we just wanted to go over a couple um, rebate opportunities that we have to help you save water. So if you're a Milpitas resident, we work with Santa Clara Valley Water District to offer several different um, rebates. So we have where you can get $2 per square foot of lawn replaced with drought tolerant plants. We also have rebates for irrigation equipment upgrades if you decide to um, use some of those for your, your garden. Um, and then we have rainwater capture rebates as well. And you can learn more about all of our different um, rebate offerings at savewatermilpitas.org. And I do want to mention that we do have a WaterWise indoor survey kit where you can kind of, with your kids, look around the house, check for leaks, and um, take some simple steps to reduce water at home. And now Megan's yeah. gonna talk about ATWD offerings. Yeah, so this, this is brought to you by a partnership. So we just wanted to highlight each of our different service areas, uh, rebates and offerings that we, can you can get as a member of ACWD or a customer of ACWD. So one I'd like to highlight tonight is the most recent one. It's the Ratio Smart Sprinkler Controller Instant Rebate. And that's the image of the iPhone and a little um, device there that you can get at $100 per uh, device. It's originally almost 280. So this is a great opportunity for you to really ratchet in on your outdoor use, especially during this hot summer. And it connects to weather stations in the area to like kind of synchronize if it's like more moist outside, it'll kind of adjust your watering cycle. So that's one new hot rebate off the press. So I encourage all ACWD customers to check out that link right there and our other rebates listed on the screen. And one little other shout out is the um, bottom square, the water efficiency master plan. Um, ACD, ACWD conservation staff has been working on this plan to be released soon and we're looking for input and feedback and so we've already surveyed several customers but if you'd like to stay in touch and in tune of what's happening and what conservation has in the future for the next 25 years in the service area I encourage you to look up that link and also sign up for the rebate or excuse me the um, info list so you can get announcements regarding that. Um, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Before I introduce our esteemed speaker, I just wanted to acknowledge that there's a lot going on. And so hopefully this hour or so will be a nice re release for everything that's on your minds. I know we're all going through it. So thank you all for attending. We almost have 100 people tuning in, which is our best attended webinar so far, at least for ACWD. So I'm really excited you guys all spent the time and hopefully this will be a nice break for you. So without further ado, we're gonna hand it over to Loretta and I'm also gonna turn off our cameras because it'll help with the bandwidth. So it'll be more streamlined, but a little background on Loretta. She's been an avid gardener, gardener for most of her life, growing annual backyard vegetables. And she's a co-founder of the Garden She's a garden manager and co-founder of Pacifica Gardens. So it's a community-run urban farm on San Mateo Coast. And her training and passion includes permaculture design and biointensive mini farming. So without further ado, thank you, Loretta. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Linda. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm going to um, uh, move myself to the uh, my picture rather than the video as well, so that we'll have better um, uh, bandwidth here as well. Okay. Right. Okay, so welcome everybody. Again, I wanna just reiterate what Megan said. This is a very, very 
unusual and um, uh, trying time for everybody. Um, but hopefully you'll have some um, opportunity this, this fall to do some gardening in your own backyard, kind of assuming that since you're attending a fall edible garden, you probably had a summer or uh, um, a spring and summer garden. We're gonna talk a, f a little bit about, um, just sort of sprinkled throughout our discussion tonight will be water wise techniques and sustainable practices. And, um, and then we're, we're gonna really talk about some uh, crops that we can grow here um, in, in the fall. Um, and yes, we already did this. So first what we'll do is we'll do a brief review of, of uh, water conservation um, uh, principles for our ed edible garden and um, what you'll need to do to prepare some transition things. We'll talk about um, the uh, um, fall um, uh, crops that you can uh, grow in, in Milpitas and in, uh, in Alameda County. And we'll talk a little bit about cover crops. And if we have time, although we may not, we might talk a little bit about, uh, if you've never made a compost pile, we'll talk about the basics. So first of all, let's talk about how we can save water in our edible garden. Obviously, most of us know this already, but very often bear repeating, we wanna avoid overhead sprinklers. They're very inefficient. There's quite a bit of evaporation. Um, the overhead sprinklers uh, um, can also contribute to soil erosion. So we're gonna be using our hand watering or drip irrigation or soaker hoses. And now we can actually um, have an app um, to plug to it as well. Uh, can and monitor our water um, consumption even better. We want to make sure that we're using organic mulch, so we're starting to collect our leaves, and um, we can use straw, pine straw, coconut coir. Um, we want to add compost to our garden soil, and we want to make sure that we're only watering when our plants need it. So as we move into the fall, we're going to have some very, very warm weeks coming up. Um, and then we're going to start having some rain. So we might have rain a few days and then we might have a few more sunny days. So you're going to be kind of going back and forth monitoring your garden in terms of its water needs, maybe even a little bit more now in the fall than you do in the summer. Most of the time in the summer we're, we're in drought, so you can get more on a more regular watering schedule. And when we're watering, when we, make, we want to make sure that we water slowly and deeply. We want to avoid runoff and soil erosion with just harsh um, um, very, um, you know, superficial sprinkles. A couple of things that we can actually do to help save water is to optimize our in-bed spacing. So I, this little image here on the left is a, a hex pattern, uh, planting pattern that will help optimize the bed spacing. So what happens is, is the plants are actually arranged in a way in which the leaves of the plants will shade the soil and, um, and reduce water evaporation. If you've never done it before, um, I highly recommend that you flat your own seeds and then transplant as seedlings. This is a great water saving technique rather than watering an entire bed that has seeds planted in it, yeah, with, the, with the one exception of our, um, our root crops. We like to plant our vegetables that have high water requirements together. So for instance, if you are gonna plant, say fall zucchini and or a cool weather cucumber, plant those in the same bed and then plant all your leaf crops in another bed. They have different water requirements. And so we'll, we'll maximize the use of our water that way. We wanna keep our weeds weeded, okay? Weeds will compete with our, uh, with our vegetables, obviously, and they also compete for water. And try not to over fertilize. I know sometimes we think that more is better, but if we over fertilize, we're gonna end up with huge leaf growth that may or may not be productive for what we're growing. And of course, all of that will consume more water. And as um, <coughs> um, Megan and Linda have talked about, um, and if you can install some rain barrels to make, make use of free water. So let's look at the, some of the things that we're gonna to need to do to prepare um, the garden. Uh, if you have a garden right now, um, we're, you're gonna kind of have to decide how much of your garden that you would like to have planted in the fall and consider the time that you're willing to spend. So sometimes we're rolling into the you know, school year, although school year has a completely different meeting now, but generally we're busier and, uh, and then we're rolling into the holidays as well. So, you know, you might not want to plant your entire edible garden space uh, for, for the fall, um, but you need to make that decision now. And then select the crops that you want to plant and either get the, uh, the seeds germinating or find a source of plant starts. 
we're going to have a little section on cover crops, um, the, sort of the second half of the hour. But I strongly recommend that um, everybody consider planting cover crops. Um, so if, if you say you're only going to use half of your, um, your current uh, garden bed and, um, as your fall veggie bed, plant, try to plant all the other uh, beds in a cover crop. Okay? Um, and, if, and if perchance you can't or you just don't, you don't have the time or whatever, um, if you have any beds that are left unplanted, keep them weeded right, and keep them mulched right, to, hold in, um, to hold in the water and then also to, to um, uh, prevent uh, weeds from actually growing. Now's the time to make um, compost. You have plenty of uh, summer crop residue probably laying around, glass, uh, grass clippings, leaves, corn stalks, sunflower stalks. Um, we can start making our compost now. And um, probably most of us do this anyway, but every so often we forget. But I would consider turning off your automatic watering system when the rains arrive. That way, you know it's off. And you know, unless of course you have a you have a completely different computerized system. Um, but uh, definitely at the big garden, we always turn our automatic uh, um, system off just as soon as the cover crops uh, have germinated. We need to take into consideration day length. Okay, right now, our you know while we're getting the days are getting shorter, but at the peak we have you know 15, 16 hours of of uh, sunlight. In the winter time um, in the Northern California where we are, we're going to get about nine hours in December. So that sounds like a lot, um, but we might have to con we might have to consider the fact that we're going to um, we may have shade issues from the fences or the neighbors' trees or um, your own house. Okay, so take into consideration what that might look like. The sun is not going to be in the same place in the fall and the winter as it is during the summer months. So we, we really want to make sure that we find the sunniest locations for our fall vegetable garden. And then just to take into consideration a few concepts here. So fruiting vegetables like beans and squash are going to require at least six hours of sun, sunlight per day. Your root vegetables will be about four to six and a cool weather and leaf crops need about four hours. Okay, so some of our crops, especially our, some of our leaf crops like lettuce and spinach, they can actually do with even less than four hours and they also can be planted in shade as well or partial shade. The other thing that we want to take into consideration is temperature. So right now, Milpitas and the East Bay, Fremont, a whole bit, um, it's quite warm. I, I, I'm in, on the San Mateo coast and, you know, even though we're having a warmer week, but it's not nearly as warm as what you all are experiencing right now. So, um, but we have to take that into consideration. And right now we're planning to plant plants that actually will do better in cooler climates. So we might have to um, kind of, uh, you know, implement some measures like shade uh, net uh, for protection. Okay, so um, uh, the, the image we have here on the right is uh, some recently planted cabbages that we planted on a very, very sunny day and I shade netted them even though we're on the coast. And uh, so you, this might be something that we want to consider uh, when we're uh, the first, if, if we still have quite a bit of warmth in September and even October uh, in the Milpitas area, <clears throat> we want to make sure that um, uh, we do shade the soil. Otherwise our cool weather crops uh, can easily suffer. The nice thing about the cool weather crops is that they do tolerate the cooler climates. So we can get down to under to freezing. Um, I don't like that, of course, but uh, um, sometimes um, we do get quite cold. And uh, if we do have prolonged freezes, though, um, the lettuces and sometimes spinach and chard can be damaged. Um, and you might actually consider something um, called agrabond, which is a different type of row covering. So when we're thinking about planning, uh, we want to get our fall crops in late August, which is right now, okay, in early September. Uh, given the fact that we're still so warm, we might want to put that off for maybe a week or so. Um, but the idea here is to get the plants established in the garden and then as the climate gets cooler, um, they'll actually do a little bit better. So they'll do better in cold weather, weather if they've had an opportunity to be in soil that has become gradually slower, uh, gradually lower, I'm sorry. Um, 
Uh, the other thing that we want to realize, and if you're a seasoned gardener, you already know this, that if we have planted some of these very same crops in the summertime, they tend to grow a little bit larger. Um, and in the wintertime, they tend to be a little bit smaller and that's fine, lower temperatures, less sunlight. Okay, that's a very common thing, but we can still get great crops. So right now, what we'd like to do is get our seed crops into our root crops. So that's gonna be our carrots and our beets and our radishes, turnips and rutabagas if you, if you want, and get those germinating. Right now, we're gonna have uh, the soil uh, temperatures are gonna be good. Uh, we might want to cover those up uh, while they're uh, germinating so that the little um, uh, birds don't come and get them, uh, but we can get those going right now. And if you want, if you are going to plant um, uh, pe uh, peas or beans, or even if you're daring and want to do another crop of zucchini and cucumbers, now's the time to get those flatted. So get those um, flatted in four inch pots or a larger, a larger pot and then you'll transplant them later. Um, and then also too, if you, if you aren't going to buy uh, starts, we can uh, get the leaf crops started as well. Okay? And if you're not up for this whole business of starting your own um, your your own seedlings, um, try to get um, try to find um, a good source for those right now. And you can always check your seed packets and the seed company websites for required um, growing conditions. So let's take a look at what we want to do in terms of preparing the garden. Uh, if you've had a garden all summer long, you've done a lot of things already. So previously planted beds are going to require minimal preparation for the fall crops. Uh, we can remove the crop debris laying around, extra things that are hanging out in the beds and loosen the soil. We don't really want to turn, we don't ever really want to turn soil because we really want to maintain the microbial layer of the topsoil but we would like to loosen it a little bit down to about 12 inches, just the, just the length of a, uh, a digging fork and apply about a half an inch to one inch of good quality compost, hopefully compost that you've made. And then we're gonna rake it into the top four inches. <clears throat> if you are gonna be planting what we call kind of heavy feeder crops like broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower or, or um, well, Brussels sprouts would have already been in, um, but um, we can add a little bit of organic fertilizer. Um, but legumes, you know, your beans and your peas, lettuces and other leaf crops um, probably don't need initial, initial fertilizer if the bed was fertilized at the beginning in the spring. And right, all we'll be using is our compost. And again, we wanna make sure that we avoid over fertilizing to, um, to prevent fast growing and giant water consuming plants. The other thing too, is that when we over fertilize and we have you know, a big burst of growth and kind of overgrowth, the plants tend to not be as healthy um, and they um, very often will attract um, uh, pests. Okay, so just think about that. I like to use alfalfa meal, organic alfalfa meal. Um, kelp is another good one to add a little bit of kelp. But you can also buy some really good uh, commercial organic fertilizers as well. We wanna have plenty of organic um, mulch on hand and making sure that it's free from pesticides and herbicides. So we can gather those things or we can purchase them. Um, I like rice straw. I don't really have an opportunity here on the coast side to grow a lot of leaves because the deciduous leaves of the trees don't really grow very well here. So I like to use rice straw. Um, if you are fortunate enough to have deciduous um, uh, trees that will uh, drop lovely fall leaves soon, we'll start saving them now. You can put them in bags or big trash cans. Um, pine straw or pine needles will work well. And then you can purchase coconut core if you want, but that also makes a nice mulch. So let's talk a little bit about the plant selection. We're really gonna be um, working, uh, looking at um, uh, what we call the cool season or the cool weather crops. So we'll have lots of leaf crops, the brassica um, uh, family, uh, some root crops and the herbs. All of these will do very well in the fall garden. In addition, you can plant a, um, um, another crop of beans and peas, right? and then also two fava beans. Um, if you are, I would say, an experienced gardener and want to take another chance, uh, and we've already mentioned this at, gro at growing zucchini, it's still quite warm um, over in the East Bay now. You might want to try another crop of zucchini or a, um, a cool weather cucumber. Let's talk a little about the leaf crops. Uh, I love leaf crops in the fall and sometimes that's all I ever get done, my herbs and the leaf crops. 
they're great because we can continually harvest them. They'll, we, after we plant them, we can start harvesting the leaves when they're like three or four inches and we'll end up with greens and lettuce crops uh, for the entire season, which is, which is great. So great um, continually harvest leaf crops are chard, spinach, kale, collards, obviously lettuce, arugula and mustard greens. Um, both are terrific for salads and, uh, and then also stir fries. And you can su succession plant the faster growing crops like lettuce, arugula, and mustard greens. Sometimes you can get more uh, than one or two crops of these. Both of, um, all of these crops will actually mature within about 30 days. So we have uh, plenty of opportunity for some leaf crops. Leaf crops, as we mentioned already, are gonna require less sunlight, okay? And they can tolerate some shade, especially lettuce and even arugula, okay? So sometimes I will, if my lettuce and arugula are gonna, are in a, in a more sunny spot, I will actually put a shade net over them, okay? Um, and for the most part, I actually grow arugula even on the coast side underneath the shade net to keep it sweet, okay? Sometimes it can get really peppery and even a little bit bitter. Chard and spinach. Um, they actually right now, if you're getting them in right now, um, or even in a few weeks, a couple of weeks, they, you might need a row, co a row cover called Agribond. Um, because of the warmth, uh, these two crops are going to be, um, uh, um, they are very prevalent. Um, they, they actually can get leaf miner um, um, fairly easily. But after the temperatures are going to cool, the row cover can be removed. So uh, in Pacifica, in the summertime, we grow the chard underneath a, um, a row cover on, almost the whole the entire season and then we take it off right with our fall crop uh, it gets cool enough and the leaf miner infestation just doesn't happen it's just too cold and cold for them okay. uh, chard plants are terrific because they overwinter very well whereas spinach has a little bit of a smaller lifespan uh, but you can usually get them right into december kale and collards are great leaf crops for the fall and again, I just, you know, I, I love kale. Every, well, not everybody loves kale, but I love kale. Kale has a lot of uh, uses. Um, the th three that are really um, most popular are gonna be kind of a curly kale, a lacinato or the dino kale. Children love the dino kale. Um, they're sort of the very long dark leaves. And then red Russian kale is, is uh, um, uh, quite good as well. In fact, that's a picture right there on the, um, uh, on the screen. Kale is very pest resistant, especially in the, in the fall and the winter, and it overwinters very well. And it's great just having kale um, growing in your yard all winter long. You can go out there, grab some for a smoothie, grab some to make a kale salad, grab some um, to uh, saute, all, all different kinds of uh, uses for it. Collard greens, also same family. Um, and and uh, collards will have both an annual and a perennial variety. If you've ever grown a perennial variety, you probably have heard it called a tree collard. We have uh, a tree collard in our yard that's been there for about three or four years now. And it gives us a year round supply of very, very nutritious uh, collard leaves. Um, and also too, um, collards are very resistant uh, to pests and they overwinter quite well. So the other brassica that we're going to talk about, um, broccoli, gylon, ca um, cabbage, and uh, cauliflower, those are all part of that whole family of cool weather crops. Sometimes we refer to them as cool crops. Um, I just want to make a note that um, a kale, collards, arugula, um, radishes, turnips, and rutabagas are also part of the brassica family, but they're more, I'm talking about them separately uh, in terms of them either being a root crop or being a leaf crop. So the ones that we'll talk about right now those are the quote single harvest brassica. They do very well in cool, uh, cooler climates, but we just want to know if we're planting a really um, a water wise garden that they tend to be less water wise um, and a little bit more pest prone. So um, I, um, I, I do like to um, uh, plant cabbages anyway for a variety of reasons. But anyway, um, all the brassica, just so you know, are going to be prone to cabbage looper and cabbage worm um, and even aphids in the warmer months. And all of this gets better as the temperature cools down, just so you know. So don't get discouraged if you feel like, oh my gosh, I've got cabbage loopers already. Um, as, soon as, uh, as soon as the temperatures cool down, 
um, um, the plants will do a lot better and the little critters go away. I'm going to take a couple of slides here to talk about a broccoli that does very, very well in our water-wise garden. Um, and we can plant um, this type of broccoli um, mid to late August and then harvest it pretty much all winter, um, winter long. It's a variety that is the Dicicchio or the, the Dicicco variety of, of, um, of broccoli. And it, um, it's an heirloom broccoli that begins producing broccoli heads in about 55 to 70 days or even a little bit earlier than that. So it has a fairly small head, right? It has a small center head. I'm going to go back to this slide here. Um, we'll be able to see that it is relatively speaking to the, the uh, broccoli heads that we're used to looking at on the single harvest broccoli plants. This is a little bit smaller, but we harvest it. Right, and then after that, this particular variety will produce little quote baby broccolis or uh, broccoli side shoots all winter long. So we can get a almost a continual um, harvest of, of broccoli. And as long as you are cutting these little side shoots, and, and um, it will continue to produce. Um, a couple of years ago, I actually had a broccoli plant for uh, almost a year. And so it just kept, it kept producing it and I was taking really good care of it. And I had broccoli for a really long time. Other, uh, another um, really great um, uh, brassica is the gylon or kylon or the Chinese broccoli. This is um, um, faster growing than uh, many of the other um, broccoli varieties. We can transplant it from seedlings and it is uh, fast growing and um, uh, which is great since so, so you can actually um, plant a couple of uh, crops if you want to. The stems, the leaves, and the flowers are edible. And like I said, it's easy to grow. Tastes very similar to regular bro broccoli. It's a little bit more bitter if you've had it before, um, but um, I just love uh, Chinese broccoli. Cabbage, there are several varieties of cabbage and there are uh, cabbages that grow better in the cooler um, months versus the warmer months. And um, I like to use a smaller size, especially in my small garden. Uh, those are the Red Express cabbage is one of those that we really like to use because it, uh, it produces a, um, a fairly small head. And again, I plant those from seedlings. And so they're all ready to go right now in my greenhouse. Uh, the cabbages um, are a single harvest crop. Um, but the great thing about cabbages is that they store very well. And you can have them in your refrigerator for like weeks, actually. And they have, they're very densely packed and the leaves, um, uh, the, the broccoli heads produce um, considerable food yield. So of the single harvest uh, brassica, I like the cabbages the best. Well, and that, well, I shouldn't say that. I've also liked my broccoli too. Other brassica that you want, to, uh, might want to consider are cauliflower. Cauliflower, again, is one of those single harvest Brussels sprouts. If you're a new to gardening, I would wait on the Brussels sprouts. They can be very tricky and they are also very pest, um, uh, very susceptible to pests. Kohlrabi, uh, savoy cabbage, and, and tatsoi are a couple of other ones that you might want to try as you um, explore your fall crops. Root crops are great for the fall garden, carrots, beets, radishes, and we've mentioned rutabagas and turnips as well. And once the, uh, once the plants are established, they're actually quite water wise because the food producing portion of the plant is in the soil. So it's, um, they're, they're actually great, especially carrots. Um, with the, um, we were talking about transplanting all, our, all of our other starts with our root crops, we're gonna direct sow those. Now I, that said, I have transplanted beets. I have transplanted carrots. Beets will transplant a little bit better than carrots. Carrots, if you transplant them, they, and they tend to um, be a little bit deformed. Um, I have transplanted uh, both rutabagas and turnips. They don't do badly. Um, but uh, they, they will do their best if we direct uh, sow them. And so for our garden, as we mentioned a little while ago, what we'd like to do is plant the root crops in the same area of our garden so that we like rows, like a couple rows of carrots, a couple rows of, of beets, so that they're all in the same area of the garden with the same water requirements. 
on radishes are very fast growing versus compared to carrots and beets and rutabagas as well. Um, they will mature in about four weeks. So you can have, you'll be able to have time for a couple of crops of radishes if radishes are what you'd like. Okay, so uh, our, um, uh, like we mentioned, our carrots and beets um, are gonna take about nine weeks to mature. The great thing about beets are that there, especially there are some varieties that have really have tall greens. Um, you can harvest, um, not all at once obviously, but you can, you can harvest some of the beet greens and just use them like chard. They taste a little bit more like beets than they do chard, uh, but they're a great addition to a stir fry or even a, you know, a uh, lasagna. I've used them with chard and spinach. Um, and beets are um, a great addition to your fall garden because they really do add a lot of, co a lot of color. Beets um, are part of the, well, they're all the same family as chard and spinach. And so if we're getting them go going in this um, time uh, in, the, in the warmer months or the warm, warmer weeks of the fall, we might need to cover those in Agrabon until the cool weather arrives. Otherwise, we're gonna end up with leaf miner as well. Onions, alliums. So we'll have in the, in the fall, winter, or, um, where there are three types of alliums that will do well in our fall, fall garden. Bunching onions are one of those, or, We've um, uh, seen them called scallions or green onions. They don't really make a big bulb. And the great thing about them is they can be grown year, um, year round and you can purchase them as seedlings or flat them now. And you'll plant them about one inch apart and then just harvest them when you need them. They're terrific. I usually have uh, at least a couple of rows of bunching onions in my garden um, um, all the time. Garlic. When we plant garlic in the fall, it's not for fall use. Uh, the garlic is not going to be mature until the following summer, so it's going to take take uh, several months. And um, if you've never planted garlic before, I highly recommend that you um, go to Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. Um, their website is groworganic.com. They have um, a couple of videos and there's some great articles on planting and growing garlic. Um, but growing garlic is quite fun. If you've never done it before, um, you might want to try it. Chives. Uh, chives are kind of more of the, uh, in the herb garden, but again, we can plant those from seed now, or we can buy them as seedlings. I like to grow my, my chives in pots right next to all of my other herbs that are on my deck. And they, they're um, a great addition to the winter herb garden, plus they have a darling little purple flower. Let's talk a little bit about the legumes, so peas and beans. And um, <clears throat> peas, uh, for the most part, they are a cool weather crop. So um, in uh, Nopitas and um, Alameda County, that's um, gonna, right now is the great time to, to plant them. We are able here on San Mateo Coast uh, in the fog, we're able to grow peas pretty much all year round, which is terrific. But sugar snap peas, snow peas, shelling peas, these are all cool weather legumes and they can be direct sown or transplanted. The thing about the peas is that most of them, even the bush varieties will need some kind of trellising. So think of how you might want to um, create a little trellis. You can even use a tomato cage. If you have an extra tomato cage laying around, you can use um, the two by four um, a hog wire mesh and create a little cage for them. And you, or if you have a fancy trellis, um, you can create, you can uh, have them climb up the little trellis. Green beans, it's not too late to have another crop of green beans. Um, if you get them in now, it's like, or like at the end of August, and um, we can uh, plant those either directly or to even to save water, obviously, uh, flat them and then transplant them. Um, there, um, um, we have plenty of uh, warm right now to grow another crop. I recommend that we uh, use a bush variety rather than a pole variety. The pole beans, while they produce a lot of beans, they take a little bit longer for the plant to start producing beans. My favorite variety of bush green beans in terms of producing quite a bit of beans <laughs> is, is a variety called provider, um, you know, which is a, a, a great name for them. Um, so if we get our green beans in now, we all have um, uh, green beans for uh, Thanksgiving. 
Fava beans are also a terrific um, fall um, uh, legume. We, um, as you, <coughs> let me move my line here. Um, um, if you've come to the coast, we, or um, hang out in farmland, you see fava beans planted um, all over. Uh, fava beans have become very, very popular as part of uh, um, commercial crop rotation. Um, and you can plant them um, as edible beans, or you can plant them as part of a, a, a cover crop strategy. The mature beans, if you've never uh, harvested a mature um, a fava bean, uh, they have to be um, shelled first, and then there's another um, a covering that has to be removed in order for the bean to be uh, edible. It's a little bit of work, but they're very, very delicious. And if you're, like I said, if you're up for a challenge and want to try a cool weather variety of cucumbers and zucchini, um, I like the market more variety. It's a cool weather cucumber or the dark green or black beauty zucchini. Um, those um, varieties are, are what we consider cool weather, or cool, will do better in the cool weather. And they are also um, not as susceptible to powdery mildew. Herbs are terrific for the fall. The herbs that do well are parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, marjoram, and oregano. And you can purchase those as seedlings right now from your local nursery. Um, you can put them in large pots um, or a garden bed if you want. Um, and if this is your first fall garden, maybe um, planting the herbs is a perfect way to get started. Um, herbs are easy to grow and are naturally water wise. So your thyme, parsley, I mean your thyme, sage, um, rosemary, those all do very well um, with less water rather than more water. I like to plant multiple uh, parsley plants uh, for um, my winter soups and holiday cooking. So I always have at least four or five of those in the bed as well. So I just wanted to <clears throat> give you this. Um, this is a very abbreviated chart here. Um, and this is uh, mostly of the, of the crops that we've just talked about the in-bed in spacing. So one of the things that I mentioned earlier was uh, in order to optimize um, you know, our watering strategy, if we optimize the in-bed in -bed spacing. So having our vegetables spaced um, in a way that is optimal for their growth and yet will also shade the soil and, um, and prevent evaporation. So what we've done here is um, giving you all um, uh, the spacing, the inches, um, uh, or no, I guess there's no feet, um, and then the approximate maturity, days to maturity. And when we say days to maturity, that is from the seed, okay? So if we're transplanting, then obviously we'll, um, uh, it'll be fewer days. And I've taken this information from the California Master Gardener's Handbook and How to Grow More Vegetables by John Jevons. So, I think now it's a good time to um, have some questions. And let's see here. Loretta, you are um, enticing everyone. You have so many questions to answer. I'll start off with some of the earlier ones. Okay, okay. Um, without, okay, so one of them is, or a lot of them are related to where to purchase things that you mentioned, like okay. straw mulch, shade nets, and cover, cover material and other veggies like do you recommend any specific stores in the region because it seemed like a lot of the questions were trying to gear themselves away from the big box stores if you know any like local yeah exactly um so i um i get most of my uh, garden supplies from peaceful valley farm supply and it's actually in Grass Valley. <laughs> um, and they have, um, they have Shade Net, they have Agrabon, they have Seeds uh, Galore. And that's one of our, 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 um, our, our, well, it is our favorite place to get things. Uh, there are shipping fees, of course. For me personally, I live on the coast. So my nursery, Half Moon Bay Nursery and Slope Nursery in San Francisco, those are the nurseries that I shop at. Um, now, it's been a while since I've lived in, um, in the East Bay, but um, I know that there were some great nurseries there. I think Reagan's was one of the nurseries that, um, and I've been there recently too. I think they have uh, um, quite a bit of um, uh, vegetables at this point too. So um, yeah, I completely appreciate the not wanting to shop at the big box stores. I, 
Uh, I trust uh, some of these uh, um, uh, Peaceful Valley Farm Supply and even some of the seed companies. At the end of the presentation, I have a number of seed companies um, that are listed there um, that, mi that might be helpful as well. Okay, because we got to get through some of these quickly. Yeah. I'll type this into the comments, but just to recap, it was Peaceful Valley Farm Supply, Slope Nursery, Half Moon Bay, and Reagan's, right? right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so another question is, is there certain leaves to avoid for mulch or is any leaf fine? Right. I know, great question. Um, we used to say we don't want eucalyptus leaves and we don't want, I mean, I don't really want eucalyptus leaves right now. Anyway, they're flammable, but, um, uh, and walnut leaves, th those types of things, those tend to be a little, um, uh, they have a little bit, of, they're a little bit toxic, but your oak leaves, your, um, uh, your uh, maple leaves, um, even oleander leaves you can use, pine needles, um, but mostly if you would like to stay away from, I would stay away from uh, eucalyptus and, and walnut at this point, but for the most part, most leaves are really okay. All right, there's a few related to timing. So when is it um, good to compost, which I know is a section in your later half of the mm -hmm. lecture, and also how do you know when to pull root vegetables? Ah, <laughs> so uh, the uh, your the if the seed packet or the seed source will actually tell you, but um, you can actually test them. If you with your root vegetables, you'll be able to just sort of um, uh, kind of brush the soil aside and be able to see the crown, if you will, of, of the root crop. And as it gets to be like for, for carrots, as it gets to be a half an inch or an inch, depends on to how big you want them, you can start testing them and start pulling them up. Same thing with the beets. Uh, you'll be able to see the little, the, they'll mound up a little bit and you can go, oh, I'm going to, and see how big it is. So you can actually start pulling them up and, te and, and uh, testing to see how big they are. Um, most of it is by trial and error. You just, um, uh, just, you know, um, pull them up and see how big they are. And then if they're too small, then just let the rest of them continue to grow. Okay, so there's a lot of specific questions about certain edibles. So like Loretta mm -hmm. just mentioned, a lot of that information is on the seed packet. Yeah. So I can't address every single one. Right. But um, as far as th some of the terms you use, I just want to make sure that the definitions are correct. So there was a lot of questions about cover crop and what that means. And then also um, down, flat now. I don't oh. know. Okay, so um, I, I'll, I can answer the cover crop questions, including its definition in the next section. Um, and then uh, in, in terms of flatting, when I talk about flatting, um, it's sort of like germinating the seed. I, I uh, use the term flatting when I'm going to put the seeds into a four inch pot with some soil or a starter flat. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, starting the seeds in a separate smaller container to um, reduce the amount of water that we use. Linda, did I miss any? Do you have any? Um, I think one more we can add is there was a question specifically of how often to water herbs like basil, oregano, thyme in a raised garden. Yeah, so when we're when we're watering the the herbs are, are basically use the same water um, rationale as you do with your vegetables. Uh, stick your finger down in there, get down to about three or four inches. If you're feeling that it's it, that it's dry there, then that's time to water them. The um, the sage, the, the thyme, and the rosemary. There's more woody ones. They they require a little bit less water. If you're growing parsley, and if you're still able to grow basil, those will usually uh, tend to require a little bit more watering. But again, um, uh, don't just water. Uh, put your fingers in the soil and uh, and and test it to see if it's if it's moist. 
you'll know if it needs water if you grab a little bit of, of uh, soil in your hand and it's crumbly. If it starts, if it's crumbly, then, then your, uh, your plant needs some water, the soil needs some water. Okay, I got one more. Um, so Michelle asked, and I also have a similar question. So when you talk about fall plants that survive in the fall, is that also synonymous with plants that do well in the shade? Or are you assuming that some sunlight gets no. them in the fall? Yeah, we're going to, yeah, we're, uh, we're assuming that we're still going to get sunlight. Even if we have cloud cover and rain, we're still, we're still getting a certain uh, amount of sun exposure. Even if we have, like I said, rain or clouds, and in our situation, fog. But one, what, one thing that we want to realize is that the days are getting shorter and the location of the sun may, may now, because it's lower in the horizon, what will happen is, is that some things might actually create shade barriers like fences that, that were fine in the summertime, but now in the fall, not so much. So in those areas that become shaded, some plants like lettuce and spinach and even arugula will do well in those more shaded areas. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> All right, so we're approaching the hour, but okay. we'll let Loretta finish some of her slides. Feel free if you need to sign off, but okay. I think this is super engaging. Everyone seems, keep the questions flowing and I'll let you continue. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, what we'll do now is I'm going to talk a little bit about cover crops. Um, well, we're not going to have time to do the compost section, um, but just so we can define um, what a cover crop is, is anything that's planted to enhance fertility and preserve soil structure, right, is called a cover crop. And they can be planted as mixes or they can be planted as, as separate crops. Um, uh, cover crop mixes are usually going to have a combination of nitrogen fixing legumes like fava beans, bell beans, Austrian peas, vetch, right, and then some carbon producing grains like oats and rye. Those are very common. Um, cover crops are going to be are typically planted at the end of the main growing season, right, and then grown over the winter. And then in the early spring, you have options. Hey, you can either green manure that, right, chop it down and dig it into your soil and then leave it there. And then and leave it there until you're as almost like a mulch, right? And have it decompose, um, or you can chop it down and make a spring compost with it. Okay, so cover crops have a ton of functions, right? So they're obviously then they're, they're going to be protecting the soil in the off season, and they're an important component of crop rotation practice. Uh, the cover crops will improve soil um, structure and fertility by prevent and prevent erosion and preventing and suppressing invasive weeds, holding the water in the soil, right? So great with that, and then help maintain the um, micro microbial life in the soil. And also too, you can get some edible legume cover crops as well. So the legumes are gonna be your fava beans and any of the peas, and they're gonna help fix nitrogen into the soil. So they're literally gonna grow nitrogen, right? And not grow, they're gonna fix nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen, and put it into the soil. And, um, and then if you have grains, the grains will grow organic matter. They have very, very long root systems and they'll grow, mat they'll grow organic matter into the soil. And um, you can actually plant some root crops. Uh, daikon radish is one of them uh, if you have a really clay soil. So that's an option as well. Cover crops are gonna attract beneficial insects. They're a great source for little birds and other insects. And like I said before, they're an important component of sustainable and restorative gardening and farming practices. Fava beans are, we talked a little bit about those as an edible crop. Um, they are, they have a prominent nitrogen fixing um, component and um, that can be used uh, as part of um, adding nitrogen to the soil. Okay, and we can grow them to maturity or we can just chop them down and leave the nitrogen nodules in the soil. As we mentioned, there's gonna be other legumes, right? That will very often will be part of those mixes and those uh, cool weather mixes also you can get at Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. Vetch, Biomaster peas, Austrian peas, bell beans, um, alfalfa and clovers are all nitrogen fixing um, uh, plants and um, they germinate very, very well in the cool weather. 
right, and are going to create a, um, a lot of biomass for our soil improvement and the compost piles. Most of us don't think about growing grains. Um, however, uh, grains, as we mentioned before, they're a great cover crop. The long root system literally grows carbon into the soil. Uh, mature grain stalks um, can add um, carbon biomass to your compost pile. And some of the grains that grow very well in Northern California are going to be winter wheat, oats, barley, triticale, and rye. And rye is one of my favorite because it has such a, um, a, a, a long, deep uh, root system and they um, uh, and grows really well in the, in the fall or around here. Okay. Right. And, and unfortunately, you probably won't get enough to make bread. So we want to, when you're selecting your cover crop mixes, if you're going to uh, a mix, again, I strongly recommend going to Peaceful Valley Farm Supply, although Johnny's Seeds and Territorial Seed, they all have great cover crop mixes. You're going to be looking for one that's called a cool weather cover crop mix versus summer, all right? Um, and um, if you want to plant separate beds, you can. Um, so when we're planting our cover crop, we want to well, we do something called broadcasting. So we're just going to sort of fling, if you will, uh, look on the seed packet or the recommendations uh, from, uh, from, the manu or from the seed company. They'll tell you how much in terms of ounces per square foot or per 100 square feet, and you can figure out how much to plant. And you're just going to loosely spread it all over your soil and kind of chop it in. The larger seeds, like the fava bean seeds or the bell beans, which is actually a smaller uh, fava bean, you, you should actually direct sow right in by pushing it, uh, pushing them in about a half an inch to um, uh, one inch deep. Okay. Right. So that your cover crops can be the last thing that you're going to plant in your fall garden. So get the vegetables in. Right. So if you're going to say plant half of your your fall garden in in uh, um, uh, fall vegetables and the other half in cover crops. Plant your cover crops last, right? So the cool weather um, cool weather cover crops uh, can germinate in fairly low temperatures. In fact, down to 40 or 50 degrees. Um, after we plant the cover crop, we want to we want to hand water it daily until they germinate. I always recommend that we cover the seeds with a shade net. Okay, uh, we want to hold the water um, uh, down. Um, obviously, we want to um, um, prevent evaporation. Uh, and then also too, we want to protect from birds. I will tell you, birds love cover crop mix. They'll go in there and they'll take out every single grain uh, that you have um, of uh, planted there. So uh, um, put a little sh uh, shade net cover there until it germinates. Uh, once our cover crop is established um, and the rains have started, very little watering is needed. And uh, so um, that's why we don't need the watering system on, um, unless of course we end up in a drought. Gosh knows what's going to happen in the next few months, but um, for the most part, when the rains start, we don't even need to water anymore. I really recommend, it sounds kind of silly because the cover crop mixes look kind of wild and crazy, but if you can get those big gnarly water consuming weeds out, um, it, uh, um, it'll be very, very helpful and will prevent competition. If you're into trying to move your garden to a um, kind of a quote, sust more sustainable effort, uh, we have the 50% rule for sustainability. Um, if you want to produce um, crops that will um, um, help you build compost and, um, and soil fertility, you should pl plant about 50% of your garden in quote, com uh, compost crops, right? And that would include cover crops as well. But during the summer months, they would also plant, you could also plant sunflowers and corn, that kind of thing. Grow about half of, you, uh, half of your garden in high nitrogen um, uh, crops and half in high, um, carp, high carbon crops. Okay, so like we said, winter rye uh, makes a great cover crop. Okay, so what we'll do is I'm gonna, we're, we're um, as we expected, um, and uh, we don't have time for the compost section here. I'm just going to flip through here just in case anybody wants to uh, screenshot something. <laughs> um, and then um, um, I wanted to just show you, um, I have a list of, here we go. Hopefully everybody knows how to make um, a compost pile. And if you don't, I'm sure Alameda County um, and Santa Clara County have great programs. I know San Mateo County does. 
uh, to help you learn how to build compost. Now here's a list of the resources that just come off the top of my head. I will be perfectly honest with you. I have like 10 times this many books sitting in my shelf. And, um, and I'm sure that there are, some of you have great resources as well. But the California Master Gardener Handbook is um, uh, the one that really does, in term, if you really want to look something up, very succinct. And my two favorite um, uh, vegetable growing books are the ones that are um, written by John Jevons and Carol Cox. And my favorite one for pests is um, the Organic Gardener's Handbook of Natural Insect and Disease Control. So uh, these are some resources. And I think now we, do we have time for more questions or is that, oops, here we go. Yeah, I wish we could give you a loud round of applause because <laughs> that was amazing. And so much is covered out in so little time. So. Again, if you have to go, res I respect your time, please sign off, but um, we're going to be entering a Q&A. So I am wondering if people have the option to raise their hand on the attendee side. If someone, yes, okay, perfect. So I will unmute um, the people that have raised their hands in sequence until about 8.30 and then we'll have to sign off. Mm -hmm. So we will start with... Ms. Krishnamurthy. Thank you. Uh, my question is on the pole beans. This is the first time I'm actually doing, I, I used to do only bush beans and this is the first time I got a pole beans. It is still producing. So I'm confused as when I should actually start the next season's pole beans uh, and when this will stop producing. Um. Yeah, so if you're gonna, so I, I'm, I'm like you, I still have, I still have pole beans, right? My bush beans are almost finished, but I still have pole beans. Um, what I would do for the fall is if you have bush beans, um, plant those. Those will give you beans, so it's August right now, so those will give you beans by, by November for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the another another crop of pole beans might be a little bit problematic because, as you know, the plants are very tall, and so they might spend most of the fall making plant and not very much time making bean. That's why the bush bean idea is, from my point of view and from my experience, better than the pole bean idea. Does that help? That helps. I'm so sorry. Just one more question. I'm sure many will have this question about the tomatoes. Uh, my tomatoes are also still producing and this year the tomatoes started a little late here in Bay Area. And so they are still producing. So should I still start my next season by planting it by January or should I delay it? Um, so for your yeah, if you're still producing, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, sometimes the tomatoes, they'll, they'll continue to produce even into October. Um, and so just, yeah, just, just let them and, but you'll still have to start, you'll still have to start your fall crops. If you're going to plant some fall crops, some cool weather crops, you'll, you'll still need to be planting those. You know, I mean, usually we say late August, early September, but it's you guys are going to be in the 90s next week, and that's going to be pretty hot. So you can probably wait until the end of September. Um, but, um, you know, kind of if it starts cooling off, you got to get them in, even if you're, you know, um, try to make other space. And, you know, sometimes the tomatoes, you get you're kind of done with them after a while, they get kind of small and hard, and you're kind of okay, and now I can kind of take them out. Um, but yeah, don't, don't, don't pull out your tomatoes if they're still producing great, um, great fruit. Sure. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Thank you. Great questions. All right. We have one more from Dolores Jones. Okay. So I'm going to unmute you now. Mm -hmm. Dolores, are you there? You might have to unmute yourself. Dolores? Hello? Can you hear us? Oh, she just muted herself again. <laughs> oh no. Okay, raise your hand again if you 
have a question, but I will continue on to Faye Baker. Faye, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Hi, yes. Uh, so I was given uh, some turnip pods. I've never grown them before. Are they something that I could plant for a winter garden? Absolutely. Turnips are great. Yeah. Yeah. So should I start them uh, in a, you know, a, before I put them in the soil since our garden is still pretty full? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Tur great. Tur turnip, turnips and beets actually will transplant fairly well. Carrots, I, okay. would, I would not ever try that again. I've, I've done it a few times. It's just nasty. <laughs> they get really, they're really gnarly. But turnips, yes. So you can get your turnips, uh, you know, plant them in either four inch pots or if you have a larger uh, flat, um, you can get those started and then get them in. They'll probably take, let's see, it is August. They'll probably be about three, maybe four weeks. Um, and then you'll, you should be able to get them in the soil about that time. Three to four weeks. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next we have Rachel Moore and then Lakshmi next. So if there were any other questions that we didn't address in the Q&A, please raise your hand because you'll have an opportunity to ask Loretta yourself. Mm -hmm. So Rachel Moore. Hi, um, so my mother-in-law um, says that she goes to the store and just buys a bag of beans or, or she has leftover beans from, you know, she hasn't used them all from soups or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she just throws them out in her beds, waters it and uses that as her cover crop. Is there any reason not to do that? Um, the, if, if you if you know it's an, if it's an organic bean um, and it hasn't been treated with anything, yeah. You, okay. You can, yeah, yeah. You you can do that. The um the advantage to um buying buying the um cover crop mix is that um it's being grown by a professional seed company and you know verified disease free and right that, that kind of a thing. Right. Um, right. But um you know people get really creative um and yeah you you know any yeah. Making, just making sure that your soil gets covered and it's growing something that's beneficial um, is definitely better. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Rachel. Next we have Lakshmi. You could unmute yourself. Hey, uh, um, sorry. Okay. Hear myself. Uh, I had a quick question on uh, ants in my raised beds. So mm -hmm. we added garden soil to our raised bed, and then since then we've seen a lot of ants, especially on my okra plants. And uh, they bring the aphids to the plants. It seems like that. Uh, so I'm wondering, like, would that be? A, I have not been able to. I tried the borax uh, mixture. Um, that I saw on the internet that didn't work for me. I'm wondering if that will still be a problem in the fall and what I can do about it. Um, it, it probably, it'll probably get better in the fall. Everything gets better when it's cooler, <laughs> if, if you know what I mean. Um, the aphids and the, and um, I'm, I'm sorry, the ants and the aphids sort of go together. Uh, once the aphid ridden crop is gone, um, usually the ants will sort of, you know, kind of go away as well. Um, I understand completely what you're talking about. We battle, um, uh, we battle ants in our raised bed, the corners of our raised beds in the, in the big garden periodically. For the most part, once we, you know, um, kind of disturb the soil a little bit, plant the new crop, put more uh, compost in, um, you know, it, um, um, it usually controls it. Um, and then the only thing I ever do for major ant problem, if it really is causing a problem, is I just keep squirting them with water. Um, that's our organic <laughs> method of dealing with them. 
Um, I see. Yeah, yeah. But I would, um, um, my guess is that the same thing will happen for you as it happens for us as we get cooler, as we replace, um, uh, put more compost in the, in, in the bed and um, take out the crop that has aphids uh, on it, then it, it does get better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, it looks like we have uh, one more person hand raise, uh, Carlos. Um, Megan will unmute you. Can you hear me? We can, hi Carlos. <laughs> hi. Um, all throughout the summer, I, you know, I, I'm a new gardener and I did a lot of these uh, self-watering containers. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems as though that I keep on running out of nutrients in my container. Uh, you know, I grew many different crops. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I grew some zucchinis and after they produced quite a few fruit and vegetables, they essentially just died and they, you know, the leaves became small and they just pretty much crumbled. Uh, similarly, I can't seem to get my snow peas to, you know, produce, uh, you know, a, a good crop and you know, they tend to the leaves tend to yellow out, you know, before they can even produce more snow peas. So what, what do you recommend as far as, you know, I've, I've just been using the, the standard potting mix soil that I get from, you know, Home Depot. And I, I do put a little bit of amendment in that, but again, it seems like it runs out of nutrients ever so quickly, you know, for heavy feeders, you know, I mean, even just lettuce and kohlrabi and things like that. Eat tomatoes actually tomatoes will mm -hmm. suck up all that nutrient every so quickly and you know, my, my containers are fairly big mm -hmm. and again there's plenty of soil in there and I, I do have a, a warm bin that I use so I've started using some of the uh, warm compost coming out of that and but then again I just ran out of food to feed these plants <laughs> You know, what do you recommend to that good that I get? <laughs> right. Well, the 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 container the the container gardening, even though it's great, um, don't get me wrong, I got my pile of containers myself. Um, but that is the limiting factor. It's it's even if you have, you know, a fairly large, because I have like 15 gallon things. Um, even though they're fairly large, that is that is a limit. Um, and so things that are going to be producing fruit, like your zucchini and um, and the peas, are going to be um, are going to be a lot harder. And even tomatoes um, are going to be a little bit are going to be a little bit harder. You're you're going to have to fertilize, as you know, um, way more than you would if you were in a standard raised bed, like a four by eight bed, or even you know just down in the soil. And that that is just unfortunately um, the the part of of, of container gardening. Um, you know, you might want to. Um, uh, what I have done uh, this past year, and it seemed to do a little bit better than in previous years, is take your standard planting mix and mix it almost one to one with compost. If you have a really good compost, um, uh, do that. And then so that, that might help. Um, your addition of using the vermiculture, the worm castings is a great idea because that will help put some life literally into those those containers and uh, container gardening tends to uh, the containers tend to uh, dry out a little bit more quickly um, and so the microbial life um, in the in the actual pots themselves uh, tends to be a little bit a bit a little bit iffy but you might want to if you're going to do it next year add a, you know take out some of your planting mix soil and add um, um, and add more compost and see if that if that doesn't help. But container gardening, those are the challenges of container gardening, unfortunately. I'm, I, I wish I had like a magic bullet, <laughs> but unfortunately. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually running a parallel experiment and I, and I have grow bags. I have 25 gallon grow bags as well. And yeah. my fear with those grow bags is, you know, the nutrients just drain right out. They do. At least with my container, my self-watering uh, containers, you know, the all the nutrients fall back into the reservoir and get sucked up. But, you know, in grow bags, it just drains right out. So I'm like, you know, chasing my tail with this. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, exa ex exactly. Those, those are definitely the challenges of, of, of container gardening. There's no doubt about it, but it sounds like you've got, you know, so you've got some really good strategies. Um, and uh, you, unfortunately, you'll be, um, you'll be uh, applying um, more nutrients than you would in ordinarily in, the, in a regular garden bed. <laughs> Yeah, I just can't produce good enough soil. Uh, that's yeah. why composting to me, I think I was so, you know, sad that you weren't going to go over composting. <laughs> I, I'm in this thing because of that, that you're not going <laughs> over it. I think we need a version two of this. <laughs> well, absolutely. And, uh, you know, um, at at the, um, you can actually email me at, um, at pacifica-gardens.org. Just go to the general and that comes into my inbox. And I, I, I'd happily send you the slides that I was gonna present tonight. That's not a problem at all. Yeah, Loretta, if you wanted to send um, Megan that stack of the ones we didn't go over, we can okay. send them out as well. And um, I know at least Santa Clara County holds composting webinars. Um, so we can definitely send out that resource as well. And I believe um, Alameda County should have some composting okay. resources, um, stop waste as well. Okay. Great, thanks. Great. Mm -hmm. So um, I think a couple Q&A questions before we okay. go to the next hand raise. So we had a couple questions about if you can grow fennel, ginger, or dill in the fall. Uh, let's see. Fennel, I think, oh, hmm. Dill, dill is a little iffy. And what was the other one? Ginger. Ginger is going to need warm. Fennel, you know what? I actually don't know about fennel. Um, I, I really don't know. Um, but I, dill and ginger are going to be a little bit, um, uh, it's going to be a little bit cool for them. Great. We also have questions about tomatoes that have bottom rot and any suggestions um, to prevent that and they use regular potting soil. Yeah, um, uh, the tomatoes that end up with a bottom rot, that is usually a, that's a watering, generally speaking, that's a watering issue. That's inconsistent watering. Um, so um, it's a little bit late now. So, uh, I'm not really sure how big they are or whatever, but um, uh, um, with, with tomatoes, um, we want to just make sure that whatever we're doing in terms of watering, we do it consistently. So the entire plant cannot dry out and then try and, and try to rewater it. So um, whenever you get the bottom rot, that is, that's what you're looking at. And um, sometimes, getting back to the gentleman that was just talking about the, the, the container garden, sometimes um, if you're trying to grow your tomatoes in large pots or the, um, the, the bags, um, they, um, uh, they'll dry out quickly. Um, and so you just have to keep, a, um, keep an eye on it. But bottom rot usually is water related. Great, I think we can go to the next couple people with their hand raised. Um, Angelia. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, hello. Hi, um, I have a question in regards to um, how to like, or, or organic ways to deal with, I believe it's a fungal issue. Uh, I grew some snap peas and cantaloupe. The cantaloupe actually grew crazy in my garden this year, but I noticed on the leaves, they started turning white. And uh, what we did to the soil, because we have that really hard clay soil, we like, took out the big chunks of clay and we amended it but it only only certain plants had like the um had the white on the leaves right so usually that white leaf stuff is what we call powdery mildew and um uh so the uh, melons and uh, pumpkins uh, zucchini um, that whole family, um, uh, some, uh, sometimes they're um, sort of um, predisposed to powdery mildew. And um, pe unfortunately, peas as well. So when you're watering them, um, try to avoid watering them 
uh, at the end of the day. If you're going to water them, water them in the morning and try not to overhead water them so that the leaves themselves don't um, uh, stay wet. So that's one thing that that's one thing that you can do. Um, sometimes I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but um, literally washing off the leaves um, will kind of slow down the um, uh, will slow down the growth of the powdery mildew. So, but that's what that is. Um, you know, usually at this time of year, the plants are getting older and um, they become, the plant itself becomes a little bit weakened, just like we all do when we get older. And, the, and so they, they actually then will start manifesting the powdery mildew. And um, depending on where you are in terms of your harvesting, um, it might be time to get the plants out of the garden. Um, I don't know where you are on your watermelon harvest. I mean, your um, uh, was it watermelon or cantaloupe. Um, anyway, so, um, you know, it, it's usually a sign that the plant is kind of at the, at the end of its season. We always know, because uh, we grow a lot of pumpkins over here, uh, we always know when the, the plants are um, starting to get a little bit stressed because of, they become susceptible to the powdery mildew. There are some um, things you can apply. I, off the top of my head, I can't think of them. We usually, we usually do everything with insecticidal soap at first and then try to spray it off. Those are some things that you might want to think about. Okay, because yeah, it started happening at the very beginning when it was like growing big and mm -hmm. it just barely started um, fruiting. The leaves just started turning white and I was like, wait, it just started. <laughs> Where, where are you? Where, where do you live? I live in Lapidus, kind of close to the Piedmont and the hillside. Okay, that's not a foggy area. Yeah, that's what I was, I, that's why I like, the first thing that came to my mind was like, maybe there's like a fungal thing yeah. going on and. Yeah, it, it, well, well, powdery mildew, well, it's a mildew, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Let me check. Um, again, you can also email me and okay. uh, see see what we can do. That's unusual for that area. Okay. okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. We have a question next from Carolyn Harris. Oh, hi. hi. I'd like to know Hello. if we oh, if we can visit Loretta's Gardens in Pacifica. Oh, oh, we'd love to have you visit. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we're still closed due to the pandemic, due to the pandemic. Um, so yeah, we usually will have uh, visitors. Um, however, um, well, I'm just going to say we are going to have a plant sale um, um, in um, the first two weekends of September, which will be open to the public. Um, so um, if you want to stop by, then we, we um, you, you can probably see it at that point, but in terms of um, coming to visit, actually we're, we're still closed just to the few of us who are maintaining it at this point because of the pandemic. I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> sorry to say that. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. And I will brag for Loretta because she's way too humble, but this Pacifica Gardens, located at 830 Rosita Road in Pacifica, is an abandoned soccer field. So it's got um, 300, or excuse me, 30,000 square feet of um, repurposed land. So that's awesome. I think we should all check it out. <laughs> Anything you want to add about Pacifica Gardens, Laura? I know as co-founder, I'm sure you have a lot to yeah. say. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, we've, been, we've been there um, for like 13 years. and. Uh, the whole purpose of the garden was to figure out a way to um, learn how to grow food ourselves. Um, and so we're largely an education project and almost, well, about three quarters of the food that we grow there, we donate to the, our local food bank. So we're kind of, we provide a community service uh, in terms of uh, um, food. Uh, but then also we provide education opportunities for school kids. We have, well, when we're not in the middle of the pandemic, we have community service days and we have field trip days and we have workshops and um, weekly uh, work days uh, open to the public, hopefully. 
uh, soon in the spring we'll be able to reopen and we invite everybody who wants to come see to come see <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Caroline, I see your hand is still up. Is there anything else you wanted to say? No, no, that was my question. Thank you, but we're, uh, we're plotting a trip already. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Linda, I'll have you take it from here. There's a few more questions. Sure, so um, let's see. We have a question on kale that was taken over by spiders and any remedies for that? <laughs> kale taken over by spiders. Okay. Um, not sure what kind of spiders. Um, and uh, usually kale gets taken over by aphids. So that's a different thing. Um, but um, uh, depends on how old the plant is itself. It, um, as we mentioned before, sometimes, um, especially if they get, um, if they're grown in too much heat, they become weak and susceptible. Um, I would take a, um, a nozzle and do my best to um, just do a water shower and try to get rid of whatever spiders are on there. And then what you can do is apply a, um, an organic insecticidal soap and that may help, like I said, I don't know what kind of spiders it is, but it, um, uh, it may help um, get rid of and or deter uh, reinfestation. Great, um, last couple of questions. We had one about pole beans, um, when they can start planting them again. They said that they're still producing now. Yeah, yeah, so um, pole beans, um, uh, if, um, what I would do is wait until spring to replant to plant the pole beans again. Um, in our area, and maybe you, maybe you guys have better luck out there, but in our area, there's not enough sun and time to grow another crop of pole beans right now because the plants are so, um, they grow so tall. Um, so I would, um, uh, you know, finish this crop out and um, and then plant them in the spring, kind of again, like in the mid mid May, right around well, right around um, Memorial Day weekend is a good time to replant your pole beans. Great. Um, we have a couple more questions before we get to them. I just wanted to give a shout out that um, we will be hosting more classes with the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency, and Loretta will actually be teaching a edible water rise gardening for beginners class um, on November 17th. So if you came to this and it was a little over your head because you've never really gardened before, please join us for, for that class as well. Um, and we have a couple other questions about soil. They said the soil is very hard and clay-like and how to best prepare it and amend it for um, gardening. So this is your classic plant cover crop. <laughs> um, so right now, if, you're, uh, if um, your plan is to just try to amend your soil and get it ready for spring, this is a perfect time to do it. So go to one of those um, um, websites, uh, Peaceful Valley Farm Supply or Seed Savers or Johnny Selected Seeds and get a cover crop mix. Uh, Peaceful Valley Farm Supply makes uh, a mix that they call the Soil Buster, and um, which is great because um, that mix um, has um, has some grain in it that will have grain seed, rye seed in particular, that will grow deep into the soil. And try to grow your cover, your cover crop now all the way until the spring, and then take it down. And um, you, I mean, take it down as in cut it down. Ooh, like I'm not too like early spring, like February, and you can take it down and make compost out of it, or you can cut it up and lay it into your soil and just sort of dig it in. That's probably the best way to uh, deal with your dry clay soil. Great. That helps. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question on zucchini female flowers falling off before they open and why does that happen? Right, so zucchini um, has a male flower and a, obviously a female flower. If the, um, if the little female flower um, uh, 
falls off um, and or the little embryo um, kind of rots, that means it hasn't been pollinated. So check your uh, male flowers, see if you have them. If you do have them, great. Um, what's not happening then is that the, there are not enough pollinating insects. So your bees or your parasitic flies or other little insects that will, you know, take the male pollen, all right, um, and, and then actually pollinate the female flower. You can actually do this yourself with a paintbrush. You can tickle the male flower and then tickle the female flower, and that will pollinate the, um, uh, the, pollinate the female flower, and hopefully you'll end up with zucchini. But that's a common problem that we all are dealing with, with the, um, the bee population problem. So what I always recommend is that if you're gonna plant plants that require a lot of pollination, so that would be all of your uh, pumpkins and zucchini and everything is plant some uh, flowers it's like borage or blue and yellow flowers that the bees like um, in, in the area and that will help draw the bees and then help with your pollination. Great. Uh, one last question is, is there a way to grow tomatoes year round with a greenhouse or another method? Um, yes, although I, I will, full disclosure, um, I don't do it. I did it um, a few years ago when I first moved to the coast. Yes, you can. Um, I know people grow cherry tomatoes in their greenhouse all year round because really tomatoes are a perennial. So if you have um, an indeterminate uh, tomato variety, um, you, can, you can grow them. I'm not, yeah, but it's, it's been a while since I've done it. So I'm not an expert by any stretch, but I know people who do it. Then we got one about pumpkin. Can you, is it too late to start growing pumpkin? It is, yeah, yeah. The pumpkins needed to go in the ground um, no later than June, yeah. Um, it, it, it'll be too late. You won't end up with uh, um, a, a pumpkin until, if at all, until you know January or February, unfortunately. <laughs> Loretta, I have to selfishly ask the last question. <laughs> Yeah, because I have a confession. As much as I love plants, I don't have a balcony. I live in an apartment. I am so impressed with how many people are questioning. Like, yeah. I'm just yeah. imagining like huge plots of land and gardens galore. And like, one of my lifetime goals is growing my own uh, salsa garden. So I have all the vegetables that I need to make salsa. No. Fortunately, that's not where I'm at in life. I am stuck in an apartment. So do you have any edible suggestions? I'm sorry if I missed it when I was typing in the chat, but that I could grow in pots indoors? Oh, yeah, indoors. Um, yeah, I, I, um, vegetables are going to be tough. Um, okay. But you can, you, if you have a nice window, you can grow herbs. I, and I have friends who herbs grow um, little herb gardens in the, in, indoors, yeah. Um, there are, um, uh, and I will, full disclosure, I've not tried them. There are um, automated, like, little growers that have their own little lamps and um, that you can um, put on your... Um, um, your, on your countertop, and I, I can't can't remember the name of it, the brand name of it. But um, anyway, so there, they there are little things that you can use, and they have their own little light, and, and they they might be kind of pricey, but it might be fun to try. Um, so the, the, those are yes. some, uh, yeah, there's only two options that I know: herbs and these little um, growing systems. That so, sounds very high tech. One day yeah. I will. <laughs> When I grow up, I will have a garden <laughs> like you all. Uh, big virtual round of applause. Leave your thank yous and comments in the questions. Thank you so much, Loretta. You are a wealth of knowledge. We had over 100 guests and we're closing out at about 40 participants still hanging on, but I left Loretta's uh, email in the chat. It's, if you want to repeat it again, it's Oh, my email. Yeah, yeah my email is um, uh, the, the general one, I think it oh, is yeah. like Pacifica. Okay, general at Pacifica slash gardens org. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's the easiest way. Yeah, yeah. yeah Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, and uh, be well and safe. And um, I hope you have a great fall garden. And um, we'll hopefully next spring, will everything will be different <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> Yes, and just as a reminder, give us a few weeks, but we'll be posting this lecture to YouTube and sending out the slides with more information. So thanks again. Have a good night, everyone.
Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone.